Uh, you would have, y'all would have not known this, but after the service, the song that y'all sang last would be perfect if, for us to close out the worship service. Y'all had no way, y'all had no way to know it about incense arising because I didn't tell y'all what I was preaching on. But essentially, the Holy Spirit confirmed the message. Amen. The message has been on my heart for quite a while. The title of the message is the drink offering. I'm going to go ahead and read Leviticus chapter 1 and we'll read verses 1 through 9 out of the King James Version. And the Lord called unto Moses and spoke unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If, many, if any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door. I want to point something out. The King James Version and only a couple of other versions have that verse right there. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will. Will. Now, when you read it in the ESV, when you read it in the NASB, even when you read it in the NIV, it still has the concept in there. But I just wanted you to see that he shall offer it of his own voluntary will. And I don't mean to start preaching in the middle of reading, but I want to make this point. There were a lot of different whole burn offerings. There were whole burn offerings that were offered by the nation each and every day at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. But also individual believers had opportunities to offer whole burn offerings. And they had to bring the offering according to their own voluntary will. There's a beautiful concept throughout the whole of Scripture. It's something that you need to understand as a child of God. God doesn't want to transgress your will. God wants you to give your will to Him. God wants you to willingly lay your will down before Him. And it pleases Him when you allow self to die. When you allow your own will to die and you allow his will to be prominent and prevalent in your life. That's the word of the Lord. So he's going to offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. He shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Listen, I want you to see this too. I can't help myself. When you see this offer, this voluntary of his own will offer, bringing the animal to the door of the tabernacle, now he's laying his own hand. It'd be like Robert bringing his own animal to the tabernacle. And as he lays his hand upon the head of this animal, it signifies that his guilt is being transferred onto the animal. Whenever you go into worship or no, as you live your life, every minute of every day, you should be reminded that when Jesus died on the cross, it was as though we all would have been walking by. I don't need to be weird. I'm going to use your hand, Shelby. We all just walked by and said, I lay my sin on you, Jesus. I lay my sin on you, Jesus. I lay my sin on you, Jesus. Every minute of every day, I wonder how our walk would look if we were reminded that basically we laid our hand on the head of a whole burnt offering that was fulfilled in Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want to say from behind this pulpit this morning, Lord, help me. Help me, Holy Spirit, to live my life in such a way that I would keep that in mind that I might bring you glory. And he shall kill the bullet. He had to kill it too. I, I didn't plan on getting into all this, but I'm telling you, it was a messy, messy sight. And the priest Aaron's sons shall sprinkle the blood, shall, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. Cut it into his pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head, and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs 
shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. I want you to also know, let's go ahead and go to Numbers. Let's just, we're just going to use one. Numbers chapter 26, verses 6 through 8. I meant to ask Miss Angela this morning if we had a port container because a hen, just to give you an idea, my understanding is that a hen is about a, is about a half a gallon. And if I'm not mistaken, four quarts make up a gallon. So I don't know really a half, a half a hen what that would look like. I don't know how many pints, eight pints in a gallon. I think something, or is it 16 pints? Miss Angela, how many pints in a gallon? You don't remember, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, the point is, it'd be about something like this, I think. A hen, a hen of wine, uh, I mean a half a hen would be about like that. All right, just to give you an idea. So in Numbers chapter 28, verses 6 through 8, it is a continual birth offering which was ordained in Mount Sinai as a, the NASB says a soothing aroma. The King James Version says a sweet savor. A sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. Next verse. And the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of a hen for the one lamb and the holy place. Shalt thou cause the strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. Next verse. And the other lamb shalt thou offer at evening as the meat offering of the morning. And as the drink offering thereof, thou shalt offer it a sacrifice made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And we're not going to turn to it, but also in Numbers 15, it talks about the fact that not only was there a half a hen of wine, but and, and in this one it says a fourth of a hen, so various offerings, one would be a fourth, one would be a half, but then also there was a half a hint of oil. The oil is always representative of the Holy Spirit. You know, you cannot pull the Holy Spirit away from the sacrifice. The two work in unison with one another, amen? And I want you to know this, that, that hallelujah, the, the Word of God teaches us that the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life. The spirit brings life. The spirit brings life that would be life more abundantly. But the spirit of God works through the sacrifice of Jesus. See, before you can walk in newness of life, before you can walk in resurrection power, your old man got to die. There got to be a real death that takes place in order for us to experience the resurrection power. Paul said in the letter to the Philippian church that I might be made conformable to his death, that I might also partake of his resurrection power. Old man got to die, my friend, so that the new man in Christ can be resurrected to newness of life. All our old ways, come on, he's ready to get rid of all that alcohol, all that drug doing. Come on now. He's ready to get rid of all that pornography, that old silly garbage. Come on now. We're sitting around here playing around with a dead possum in a sandbox like we're some little two-year-old child. No. The Lord, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Jesus paid the price for you to be free. And now that he gets rid of all that, oh, now he's really ready to do some work. Yeah. He's ready to get down there and start taking around with our heart. Our personality issue. Matt Hebert's obnoxious arrogance. Oh, yeah. We got to cut all that stuff out of there because it gets in the way and it offends people. And you over here, you preach Jesus. This isn't in my notes. None of this is in my notes. You preach Jesus, but then your attitude and your behavior doesn't look nothing like it. I'm using myself as an example. Uh, hallelujah. Does that take, take, take the weight off of you, my friend? I use myself as an example. But if, the, but if the rich fits the, I don't even know why I said that. If it fits, and if it don't fit, go ahead and move the crescent wrench to where it does fit, because I guarantee you got some of it in you. That's right. Every last one of us got some of it in us. Yeah. We got something that the Lord wants us to voluntarily, with our own will, bring to the altar, transfer it over to Jesus, and let that thing die. Good. That thing needs to die so that resurrection power and the fruit of the Holy Spirit can take its place. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Savor of the Lord. So, so there's this drink offering that's poured out upon the whole burnt offering. And the oil of the presence is interconnected with the whole thing. And whenever you and I begin to truly walk in what the truth of God's word is trying to teach us, again, the old man born of Adam dies and a new man, behold, all those that are in Christ Jesus, all things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. New life in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. And so I wanted you to, to see that picture. You know, we've covered some of the thoughts about the whole burnt offering recently. I was praying with Pat the other night, and he said, I remember that. And he was talking about, search my reins, Lord. Remember when we prayed, when we taught about that? Search my heart, oh Lord God. Find out if there be any wicked thing in my heart. And there's another one. Search the reins. Having to do with the kidney and the call and the liver. That's what it talked about in the whole burnt offering. It said it was flayed. Cut open. Pull the insides out. Wash the entrail. Inspection. I might, I might get a, a rabbi to come over here. And might. I got to talk to him on the phone. But I think it's going to be question and answer time. Inspect the intestines. Make sure there's no tumors hiding behind the kidney. You see, because it had to be a type of the one that would come. Who, like the bread we talked about, had no leaven in him. Had no sin in him. Oh, cut that big old calf, calf open. Let's go ahead and inspect it. Oh, look, we finally found behind the spleen a little tumor. But get rid of that one, get another one. Until we find the right one. Keep cutting them open, inspecting them. And then once you find it, we're going to wash the insides out. We're going, to take, we're going to take the skin off of this thing. We're going to separate its parts. We're going to cut its legs and its shoulders off. We're going to wash those legs too. And then guess what we're going to do? We're going to take that carcass. I like to imagine what that looked like, and we're going to arrange it on the altar. It's arranged. It's got the head, got the fat, got the got the legs. It's all in arrangement, and it's being offered up. And then at some point in time, they're going to pour a half a hint of oil on this thing, and then they're going to pour a half a hint of wine on this thing, and the incense, the smoke is going to rise. It's going to be a sweet savor. In the nostrils of God. The NASB says a soothing aroma. The King James Version says this. This is what they, this, this is their opinion. Odor. No, I'm sorry. Odor is how they put it. Yeah. Old English. Odor. Of soothing. I guess they're trying to let us know it's not an odor. Fragrance. Odor of soothing would be the technical term. This is what Strong says. The technical term for sacrifice of God. Odor of soothing. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, my brain gets to work, and I can't help but ask a couple of questions. Number one, why was, a, why was it a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord, if we're going to use the King James Version? Why was this a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord, and what was being soothed? I mean, it shouldn't really take that much thought, but let's think. Why was it a sweet-smelling savor? What was it that was being soothed when this offering was brought before the Lord? Certainly the thought about this sacrifice being a type of Jesus must have been pleasing to the Father. Amen? Whenever he would peer down upon this and he would understand, nobody at that time really knew. The prophets might have had little inclinations here and there, but nobody really knew the Father's plan and completion at this point in time. But yet every time at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. the nation would offer the whole burnt offering, within the day, scattered throughout, the individual believers would bring their whole burnt offering, and it was a constant Incense being allowed to rise before the Lord, a constant reminder, and that the Father would be saying, that's my son right there. That's my son right there. Come on, let the savor rise. Let it soothe. Let the odor of soothing rise into the air for the sin of mankind and his wickedness is evil upon the earth. But I am long-suffering. And I'm going to make a way. I'm going to make a way, make a way of mercy. I'm going to make a way of grace. I'm going to empty heaven of its most prized possession. And I'm going to give him as a gift to sinful man 
for this is how I choose to commit my love towards man, and that while they're yet sinners, my precious only begotten son will be the sacrifice for their sin. You're not going to ever be able to convince me that that's not why it was a sweet savor in the nostrils of God. You'll never be able to convince me that that's not why it was an odor of soothing. It soothed him. God is a God of emotion, my friend. The Bible teaches that Jesus wept. The Bible teaches that one day God is going to release judgment upon this earth. Does that make you feel weird when I preach on judgment? When I, no, when I tell you that one day grace is going to run out and judgment is going to inflate this earth. That's right. There's going to be a day when they will, even if they cry, it's going to be too late. Now, I don't know about you, but what that makes me want to do is it makes me want to plant my face in this car. It makes me want to cry out to God and to say, Lord, please use me. Lord, please use this church. Lord, please cause souls to come yeah. into a place where you can change them and give them hope. Amen. Where they can experience your presence and the truth of your word and that they can be changed on the inside so that they can be hope. Not just so that I can come in here and worship the Lord and get my own little personal free zones on Get my own little personal goosebumps. I like goosebumps. I like free zones. I like to feel a little, a little, all the, I love to feel the palpable presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. I love it. I love to be blessed by the presence of the Lord. But listen, it's bigger than me. That's right. It's bigger than me, Christian. That's right. Oh, but I'm a king's kid. Come on now. Don't get me started. Don't you get me started because I'm about to get ugly up here. I don't want to be ugly. They got two kinds of king's kids, my friend. One that walks up in there, he got a little snotty nose, and he's like, I want what I got coming to me. I'm a prince. I'm a co-inheritor. Give me my inheritance. That's what the prodigal acted like before he got down there eating with the, with the pigs. But then there's another one. He's a prince, and he's humble. And he understands the graciousness of the, I was born a king's kid. I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. You're so good, Father. Why would you love me this much? Dude, See, yes, two right. kids that belong to the king, two completely different attitudes. Amen? Does that make sense? All right. That's not my message, but you get the point. An odor of soothing. You know, we should have great gratitude. Our hearts should be filled with mercy and grace for others when we realize that, though, right? Amen? About the goodness of God. Hallelujah. When he would look upon this, I have, can't help but believe that he would look down and he would say, my wrath can be held back for a period of time. Let it flow. Let it be soothing. Soothe, soothe the anger and the wrath of God. You know, God's been offended, my friend. You, do you realize that? I mean, listen, we've all thrown our anti in the pot, too. Let's not forget that. I mean, don't maintain your regret. That's not what I'm trying to tell you to do. But I'm just trying to make a point. We've all thrown our anti into the pot. Hallelujah, but he's a good God. And, and, and mankind has offended him. God is the offended angel. Right? Amen. Amen. And, and, but yet he made a way so that we could be reconciled. And he sends Jesus. And once he sends Jesus, his wrath can be held back even a little bit longer. Hallelujah. But you know why? He went? Because he's long-suffering. Right. He's not really like you and I a whole lot. And when I mean that, I don't mean to be ugly. I'm just saying, one of the, I just want to speak true. One of the, one of the fruits of the Spirit is long-suffering. To suffer long. That's different. That's a little different than endurance. Endurance is patience for relationships. Long suffering is endurance and patience. I'm sorry. Endurance is patience in situations. Long suffering is patience and endurance in relationships. Hold every ball game. Come on, somebody. I'm, step, I'm about to step on somebody's toe. Because we ain't got a lick of patience for people that are around us. People that are closest to us, as soon as they do the wrong little thing, we're ready to write you on. I'm done with you. We get so ugly. Come on. I, how you know so much, preacher? Please. I've been the ugliest of the ugly. That's how I know. I don't want to be that guy. I want to let the Holy Spirit have his way with me. I want to learn that Jesus was long-suffering with me. He is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yes. And when he sees the whole burnt offering, it says there's coming a day.
day when I'm going to send my son, and now that he sent his son, he says I can be long suffering just a little bit longer. Right. I'll wait just one more day for one more sinner to come in. Hallelujah. For one more Christian to show love and one more sinner to come in. Amen. Can you go to <coughs> 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll read verses 6 through 8, because I want to add a little caveat to the drink offering. To let you see what the Apostle Paul said about this. He says, for I am now already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. So I want you to think about this now. you got the Old Testament priest. The animal slayed. It's opened up. It's washed. It's arranged on the altar. And then, so the animal is Jesus. Although Jesus voluntarily, willingly laid himself whole self down, and in a type and sense, God is asking you and I to voluntarily lay ourselves down. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but he liveth in me. He cried, the Lord's asking you and I to also lay our life down, but specifically the Apostle Paul connects the drink offering to himself. He connects the pouring out of himself to the drink offering. Now, if you're going to say, oh, you have to ask the Apostle Paul preacher, hold on a second. You came to the wrong church this morning. No. Because, see, again, I'm going to keep reminding you of this. El Dad and me, Dad, they were prophesying in the camp, and the young man comes and said, make them stop. And, John, and, John, and Moses said, you do this out of envy for me. No, I would let all God's people be filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesy unto the Lord. God wants all of his people to be prophets, especially in these last days. If we're Pentecostal believers, if we believe in the charismatic movement of the Holy Spirit, if we believe in the gifts and the operation of the Holy Spirit, and we're crying out that the Lord would use us with gifts, he wants you to leave out of here today, and he wants to bring somebody your way, and he wants to give you the opportunity to share Jesus. He wants you to be a drink offering in somebody's life, and he wants a sweet savior. A soothing aroma. Yeah. But I'm not there preaching good. Well, you just keep on coming back there, my friend. You keep on coming back, and sooner or later, it's going to catch on you. That's right. He's going to heal you. How you know that? Because he told me. Yeah. You know what he told me? He said, get out of my way. I know I keep telling you all that, but I'm not going to let you forget. Get out of my way, boy, because I want to move in so I can move through. Hallelujah. He wants to heal you. He told me he wants to heal heal you. And if you'll let him, oh, 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 I'm telling you right now, he'll set you on fire. He'll send you out of this place right here. You'll be laying hands on the sick in public. You'll be, you'll be praying for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in public. You'll be preaching Jesus in public. Oh, I love that song. I shout Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the street. Hallelujah. Let the name of Jesus be magnified. He wants to do that in you, church. Yeah. At your workplace. Oh, I'm going to lose my job, man. Jesus gave you that job. Be respectful. Yeah. I'm walking there like that snotty-nosed little king's kid. No, walk in there with the humility of your king. Need I remind you, Jesus rode on a donkey the first time. Great power in his meekness. In your weakness, his strength is made perfect. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. What? He lowered himself. Don't walk up in it. No, but if you handle your business right, my friend, if you hear from the Holy Spirit, the Lord will use you. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good faith, for good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. We're going to use this one again next week because I'm preaching on the judgment seat of Christ. You do not want to stand before the Lord and find out. You left something on the, you didn't leave it on the field, my friend. Daddy used to say, boy, let me tell you something. When you get on that field, you better leave it all on the field. Every drop of blood, every, I know this is a game, but I'm just trying to tell you. That's an idea about how I should be living my life for Jesus. Leave it on the field that when I stand before him, I will hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. He says, I finished the course. I've kept the faith. In the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. Now, listen, I've got to tell you something. When he writes this letter, it's very interesting. I want to go to Rome one day. 
I don't want to visit. This is the one place. Every time somebody tells me they're going to Rome, because, you know, I work with doctors. I'm going to Rome, you know. I'm like, well, I don't know. You're going to go to the Mamertine prison. It's the Mamertine prison. It's just a little bit of the old dungeon. Dungeon in the middle of Rome somewhere. The just dug out hole where Peter and Paul, they both spent time in that dungeon. Paul writes this from the Mamertine prison. This is when he writes to, to Timothy, bring the cloak. It's cold. Bring the papers, bring the papers so I can read. He's waiting for Nero to call his name on that. Paul don't make it out of this. He, according to church tradition, Paul doesn't make it out of this dungeon. His name is called Nero, puts his head on the chop and block. And there his life is. I don't know what you're going to say because, I mean, this man saw miracles, unbelievable miracles. He was preaching so long one night that old boy fell asleep, fell out the window, broke his neck, and died. And Paul walked out there, and okay, that man, that brother came back to life. Saw dead people raised from the dead. Yet his life ends with his head on a chopping block. How you gonna rectify that in your your faith walk? I don't know, but guess what? One day you'll get to see you'll, you'll see the Lord. You'll get to see the Lord, and you can ask him. But in the meantime, you know what Paul called it? A drink offering. <laughs> he said, I am a drink offering, and I am being poured out upon the Lord. And hallelujah. He also explains in this very letter that many believers had forsaken him because they had become ashamed of his chains. For now, he said, the apostle likened it to being a drink offering that resulted in a pleasing aroma to God. Look at 2 Corinthians. I love this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. Let me, let me, don't even go there. Let me read this to you out of the ESV. I want this another literal translation. Okay, so just bear with me. I just want to read it to you. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. I want to read it to you in the ESV version. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and I went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Boy, that's some deep stuff. We're not, we're not talking. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Man, have you ever read, I was thinking about this, have you ever driven behind a garbage truck before? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You try not to do that, right? Oh, well, how did this happen? Right? <laughs> but also think about those mosquito sprayers, you know, and they're driving around and you can see that mist coming out. And I was thinking, could you imagine if they was going around spraying like a beautiful fragrance in the air? And you would just drive, you, it, I mean, like it wasn't harmful to your body. You just roll down the window, right? And you, you probably would follow that truck. Oh. And I was thinking about the Apostle Paul, because look what he said. He says, and the, actually you can put that up there in the King James. Let's see what he says. It may not be. Uh, that would be 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. And, and he says, the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. He makes it manifest the savor of his knowledge by us. In every place. That word savor there, that word fragrance, incense, whatever you want to call it, is the same exact Greek word that's used in the Septuagint. I'm not going to get into all of what that is. The same Greek word that's used to talk about that sweet smelling savor we talked about with the whole burnt offering. That's what the Apostle Paul's saying. We are being like the smoke that ascended into the nostrils of God. That was a soothing aroma to God. Everywhere we go, when we when we bring forth the knowledge of Jesus in the public places where we go, it's like a mosquito sprayer that's releasing the fragrance of Jesus in the air, my friend. The devil don't like it when you take your voluntary will and, re and take your vessel and say, I'm emptying myself out, Lord, that you'd fill me up so that you can pour me out. I pray that you'd bring me uh, through into Walmart. I pray that you'd bring me in the streets. Bring, open up a door in the Centerfield Jail. He did, by the way. I'm going to meet with her Wednesday, so y'all need to get y'all our drop y'all's applications off. And listen, whoever else wants to come, we're about to bring Jesus into the jail. jail. Yeah. Hallelujah. I say we, we start praying that he bring us into some of these women's shelters. 
altars where these women are hurting. Bring us, Lord. Send us, Lord. That we can bring hope. Open up doors of opportunity. Nursing home. Wherever we can go, let us bring hope. Amen? Amen. That's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, it's like a fragrance. We got the triumphal procession in Jesus. I'm about to preach a whole different man. We got a triumphal procession in Jesus. And everywhere we go, the fragrance of Jesus is being broadcast. In God. You know, Jesus' is a, entire life was a drink offering. Real quick, it seems appropriate that Jacob would pour out a drink offering on that rock stone pillar where he saw the portals of heaven open up and a ladder from earth into heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the ladder. Because Jesus said in John chapter 1 verse 51, from this day forward you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. What did Jesus just say right there? You're looking at Jacob's ladder, buddy. You're looking at the connection point between earth and heaven. You're looking at the connection point between the spiritual and the earthly. Right here, my name is Jesus. I saw you under the fig tree, son. I saw you under the fig tree when you were studying the scriptures. Oh, that's another story. Jesus willingly laid his life down. The word of God says, Isaiah chapter 53, like a lamb led to the slaughter, he did not open his mouth. Jesus says of himself, John 17, 18 through 7, Therefore doth my Father love me. Why? Because I lay my life down that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I will lay it down to myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. See, Jesus willingly laid his life down. That's right. And he's looking for us to willingly lay our life down. He he will cajole you. I don't even really, I can't give you a definition, but I remember my mama used to use that word. He got something to do with it. He will. He'll do to you what he did to Solomon. Yeah. Who are you, Lord? I'm, I'm the Lord. I'm Jesus whom you persecute. You keep kicking against the pricks. I'm over here priding you in your hindquarters, boy. I'm hitting you with the electric prod because that's what it's talking about. The prick was a goad. I'm over here hitting you trying to get you to go in the, wrong, the right direction and you keep going in the wrong direction. Why are you kicking against the pricks? He wants to get us to the place where we'll willingly lay ourselves down. Jesus said it when we took communion, Father, if, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Mm. Paul's understanding of the drink offering was that the people of God were to be like Jesus. He says it to the Philippian church. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He lowered himself. He, he became us. Hebrews says, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. He became us because we were partakers of flesh and blood. Because, see, Adam, in his sin, allowed the devil to have power over the fear of death. The devil, in sin, has power that resulted in death. And mankind has fear connected to death. But Jesus became us because we were partakers of flesh and blood and could die. Because, see, God can't die. God became a man, clothed himself in human flesh, so that he could offer his life as a sacrifice, so that he could remove from the devil the power regarding the fear of death. You have nothing to fear if you are a true child of God. I know that's easier said and easier preached than it is believed, but I'm here to tell you this morning, the Lord says, Paul said, the Holy Spirit said through Paul, to be absent from the body is to be present. Yeah. Help us, Lord. Hallelujah. In Galatians, it, 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 listen, he says the same mind that was in him, he wants it to be in us. In Galatians 2.20, I've already quoted it once this morning, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but he liveth in me, and now this life I live. Boy, this is good right here. I've been quoting it wrong for a long time. Now the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Hallelujah. I don't even want to live 
living on my own faith no more, my friend. I want to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is it that Jesus can't believe the Holy Spirit to do through him? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody was telling me they went to the nursing home the other day. And they said, I remember, I couldn't remember that word you said when I said appendages. You remember that? When I said, you sit over there praying and some person has a, you know, like a, 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 a nub. And it's like, you, you know, you know God can do that. Y'all know he can. Yeah, yeah. But boy, it's going to take a little boldness to reach down there. And guess what? Come on, somebody. It ain't my job to make the appendage grow. That's his job. But he's telling me I want you to be able to believe me anyway. They said they was in the nursing home and, it, and some person said that they were, had a pain in their leg. Well, people that don't realize this in healthcare, we know that sometimes whenever you had an amputation, sometimes you get something called phantom pain. <laughs> they read down to the crib on that leg, there wasn't no leg. <laughs> They're like, hallelujah, make it grow, Lord. They was expecting it to grow. They said, well, maybe tomorrow it'll be there. I believe it's going to be there tomorrow. The point is that it ain't my job to make that leg grow. What you going to do? You going to quit praying for it when you get down there? Lord, help us anyway. He also says in Romans 12, 1, he says that, that not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal, to offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Yes. You know, this message has been on my heart for a little while now, and I forgot in the note that I put the rich young ruler in it. And then Angie preached, and she talked about the rich young ruler, but when he you know, it says that when he heard the saying, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. But it's just that one thing, whatever that one thing was, he, he just he just couldn't do it. He just he went away sad because well, I've done that. Hey, I mean, I would imagine. I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. Okay, well now all you got left to do. And you know, it is the Lord, dude. <laughs> the Lord knows. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you right now, he knows exactly. Right, <laughs> right there. Yeah. Boom! That's your thing, son. Yes, yes. Boom! Mm. And boy, it don't feel good when he does. That's right. right. Now why you want to press my button, Lord? I thought I wasn't supposed to be pressing people's buttons. I thought I was. I'm the pot of you to clay. I'm going to press your burden, son. Because I'm trying to show you what you're about to Because yeah. I want to do it. Yes, Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. But that was that one thing. He couldn't let it go. The man that was given the one talent buried it in the ground. He just let it lay there unproductive. You know, I was thinking about this as an ICU nurse. I was an ICU nurse for a couple of years before I got my master's in nursing. And I really, to be honest with you, through that through the funerals that I've done, through the own personal tragedies that I've experienced in my life, I really have really experienced more death than I probably would say that I would have preferred to, but I know that God has a plan in that for my life. He's taught me some things through it. But uh, one thing I, I remembered, I've learned some things about human death. I've been exposed to a lot of human death. I have, as an ICU nurse, it's different than being an ER nurse. I'm just saying that. I'm not saying it's better or worse. I can't, I can't start IVs like an ER nurse. I'm getting better, though, because I keep starting my nurse's IV. But I'm trying to make a point. I've been exposed to some death. Something that I learned in death is this, is that whenever a life goes and it's not like an immediate tragic event, like in other words, it's a disease process and they're kind of lingering a little bit, I've seen some things, like the body tries to continue its functions. The brain signals the lungs to breathe. The cells are craving oxygen and they struggle for more. The weakened state of the body reflexively gasps in agony for another breath. I can remember being by the bedside on multiple occasions speaking to family members. I don't know when the first time I heard one of my elder nurses say the word, but after they said it, I was like, what was that word? Well, that's what we call it, man. That's what it is. And from that point moving forward, we just use the word. What is the word? I remember being by the bedside. They're removed from life support. The family says, look, he's breathing. And I would have to say, yes, ma'am. It's called an agonal breath. Its source is agony. The body 
is in agony, and we call the breath agony. It's a feeble attempt to hold on to life. It can't put enough oxygen in the lungs for it to be diffused into the bloodstream so that it can go to all the cells that require life. It's insufficient. And so I would say it's an agonal breath, ma'am. I've got to go check up on the patient, but I'm here for you. If you need something, let me know. Well, why is the heart rate going up? Because the breath, the agonal breath isn't enough. So the heart is trying to compensate to distribute the little bit of oxygen that's in the blood to get it to the cells that are crying out for oxygen. Then you come back in, and now all of a sudden the heart isn't going for so fast anymore. Now it's kind of like, well, well, why is this heart rate? Because that's an agonal heartbeat. Because in agony, the body is trying now and it's done tuckered out because it can't keep up anymore. And it'll get to the point where it gets less and less, to the point where if you actually went over there and you put your fingers on their wrist, you might even see a blip on the radar and there's not even a pulse anymore. Because the heart is still trying to produce something called an action potential where the calcium ions and the sodium ions are exchanging and make do. This body is so fearfully and wonderfully made. God done put an electrical conduction system within your heart that with the influx of calcium and sodium through these channels, it causes an electrical uh, impulse to build. It's called an action potential to build up until pow, the heart beats. And then it pumps. And you will literally sometimes have an action potential that will be recorded electrically on a monitor, but there's no more heartbeat. What is the point to all of that? The point is this, is that it's trying to hold on. The body is trying to hold on as much as it can until there is no more. And this makes me think of our spiritual lives. How so often we cling to self. I'm not talking necessarily about open and blatant sin anymore. That does fall under the purview of what I'm talking about. But let's just move the sin stuff out the way. Sometimes we cling to our own will. I preached about that Wednesday. We cling to our own self, what self thinks is right, as opposed to what the Spirit wants to reveal to us. We're sitting here holding on in agony to self. And if we would just let a little bit go, I'm telling you right now, the Holy Spirit start to flood in, start to talk to you, start to show you, I got something better for you. And you would just trust me a little bit. Amen. Help us trust you. Help us. We just like that angle of breath, that angle of beat. Spiritually, we're going through the motions of what we want for our own lives and our own plans. He's got something better for us, Christian. And with a drink offering, the whole vessel is poured out. You don't think that the, the priest is like, little sip, give me a little sip, Lord, right? And a little sip for you. A little something, something for you. No, 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 the whole thing is poured out. I will be the first to tell you that I have not arrived. But that's what I'm asking, that my life would be a living sacrifice for the Lord, that he would use me as a vessel that would be pleasing to him. Listen, this stuff isn't going to go over well in every church. I'm not trying to act like we got something figured out. That is not what I'm doing here. I'm trying to make a point to you. Churches, even in this area, I'm not telling you which ones because I don't go sit under their services. I don't know what they're preaching. But I've been in enough churches in this modern revolution of what we call a relevant church movement, secret sensitive movement, to know that they ain't over here trying to tell people to die to self. It's a social agenda. To, how do you know this? Because the Apostle Paul warned in the last days that they were going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, that they were going to heap unto themselves piles of preachers that would tickle their ears. And the word tickle means give me pleasant words. I'm going to give you pleasant words. Lay your life down before him and watch him move, my friend. Watch him heal. Watch him fill. Watch him do a work in you. Watch him move and watch true joy. We over here looking for joy around every corner. That was an old country song back when I was growing up in the 80s. Looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> looking for love in too many faces. Oh, Lord, we're looking for love. 
You ain't got to look for it. He's on the, he was hanging on the cross. It's written in the Word. Hallelujah. I think most of us would agree that we're living in the last days. Would you agree with me on that? Do you, and, and let me ask you this, really. No, I don't mean, I don't want you just to agree with me. I, I'm, I'm really, it's, do you believe God is looking for people that are willing to be poured out and used by him? Yes. yes. Do you think God is looking for churches that are willing to let him work through them? Yes. Do you think that God has been telling us here at this church that he wants to use us? Yes. yes. Amen. What is your part in pouring out? I mean, I got a list of things. Is, is your part to teach? There, there's probably teachers sitting right here. I mean, there are teachers sitting here, but there's probably others. Is your part to pray? To pray healing over people? To operate in the gift of healing? To is your part? Is your part to release prophetic words? You're listen. I've been through this, my friend. You are not looking at a pastor that wants to hide the Holy Spirit in the closet anymore. That's right. Amen. I want the Holy Spirit to be out front. I want his gifts to flow. That's right. yep. That means, listen to me, some preachers want to have all the gifts. And don't get me wrong, I'm going to tell you, and here I'm praying, Lord, give me some gifts. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, but listen, I have come to the conclusion he wants to use you. Yeah. <laughs> he told me that. Yeah. I want to use them, son. He ain't, I have a feeling he ain't. No, let me know. I don't want to speak negative. I want to speak a negative confession. I don't like the devil's in the tongue, but I will say this. I have this feeling. Let me tell you why, because I felt it in my prayer. That he is not going to continue to increase my prophetic anointing until y'all start releasing some of y'all. Mm -hmm. And you know why? Because he knows me too well. He's like, boy, if I start letting you operate in prophecy and this, that, the other thing, you are just trying to take over the whole show. They got a lot of preachers that don't want to let nobody in the body of Christ be used by you. You know how I know that? Because I've been in the church here. I was in a church one time in Homa, and a woman brought forth what I thought was a word from the Lord, and he said, no, sister, that's my word. Oh, oh. Shut that girl down. Shut that woman down. Oh, oh look, you better take that control spirit down the road, Jack. The Holy Spirit yeah. don't want to be locked up in the closet that's no right. more, and he wants to use his people. Right. So is that what your calling is? Is that your drink offering? Is that what you're called to be poured out? To, to release prophetic words, to release prophetic interpretations of tongues, to pour your heart out in worship. Is that part of what your drink offering is supposed to be? Listen, I'm not trying to make you feel weird. If you want to sit down in the back, I want everybody to be comfortable to worship the Lord the way they want to worship the Lord. I'm just asking you to worship Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But something happens when we all, and listen, yeah. you can't cajole people to do this. It has to be led by the Holy That's Spirit. Right, yeah. But I'm just trying to say thank you for the times you let the Holy Spirit lead you and y'all just kind of come up here like that, right? Really, I'm not trying to make you do it because then it gets weird. But I'm saying thank you for the times when it happens. And y'all know what I'm talking about. There's like five of y'all get all up at the same time and I know y'all ain't whispering to each other. And then we're just all up here on our knees worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Is your drink offering to be... The one that's going to worship the Lord to intercede, to come on Tuesday night. Listen, it's a big deal. Tuesday nights and Friday, but I feel uncomfortable. Okay, sit in the back till the next thing you know. I mean, it's kind of funny. And I'm, when I say people's names, the only reason I'm even saying Bill's name in this situation is because he was so, he, he, that he became so different and out of character, it seemed like. The first time that I've said it before, Kirk and Brenda had his music. It I didn't like the music that much. But I'd already been through that when I went to cross the place. I didn't like their music. And the Lord told me, son, you better get over yourself. Because they ain't about nobody's music. It's about me. Okay. And so anyway, they had their music playing. And dude, I didn't like their music. For some of y'all, I don't like my music. And it's okay to only talk about them behind my back. I'm like, I'm I expect people to do that. It's not going to stop me. I'm just like, I'm not trying to say you're trying to stop me. I'm just letting you know you ain't going to stop me. Amen. I'm going to keep on seeking the Lord, and I'm going to keep on doing what he's telling me to do, even if you talk about me behind my back. Absalom. Uh-oh. Anyway, <laughs> hallelujah. Yes. 
I crawled up in that closet right there on that dirty carpet to get away. And the Lord, what are you doing, boy? Get up. Get back out there. Get up in this corporate prayer and come get you some of this. Because I love to praise alone. I love to pray alone. I can just act a fool for Jesus when I'm all alone. Hallelujah. But guess what? There's something valuable in corporate intercession. Yeah. And that night, I'm telling you, about the, the next Tuesday night, Bill was up in here and I could see him pacing back and forth in the back. And, I, and I, the Lord gave me the sermon. I said, Bill is struggling with the same thing I was struggling with. He's struggling. He's struggling with that music. I mean, I could be wrong, but good. Was he? Yeah, he shook his head. He struggled with the music. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, that dude bust out loud in prayer. He ain't, I don't think he's ever prayed like that. I could be wrong, but maybe he did that way back in the day. But the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that God will do a work. And I'm not even saying that you're going to bust out loud and pray like that. You may never pray like that. And you don't have to pray like that. You pray like God's called you to pray. The point that I'm trying to make is, is your drink offering, your, your pouring out of your drink offering to be part of the intercession. Listen, I don't mean to keep saying it, but I'm going to say it. It's only 1130. We're good. It's only 1130 according to my watch. All right, so listen. If, if your drink offering is to pour yourself out in intercession, I'm telling you, I never realized this before. Forgive me, please. Forgive me for not knowing that intercessory prayer warriors are more important. Than the preacher preaching his message. <laughs> no, really. Amen. Because if we ain't got the anointing of the Holy Spirit right. moving up in here, we ain't got nothing. Right. Amen. Amen. If we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to move in our lives and in this church, we need prayer. That's right. That's right. And I can tell you right now, I'm so grateful for you guys that show up over here on Tuesday nights when you can. Friday nights when you can, before service, even if you only get here 10 minutes before, hallelujah, come in and let's cry out together and let's ask the Lord to do something. Amen? Amen. So what is your drink offering? Are you supposed to be part of a music ministry? I don't know. That, that'd be nice job to figure that out. Not nice in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Are you called to help finance the move of God? No, you all are. Listen. I, I, didn't, I don't want to get into this too deep, but I'm going to say it a little bit. Your tithes and offerings, are, your tithes are supposed to be brought into the storehouse. And that's right. Amen? Yeah. Well, what is the story that there might be meat on my table? Well, when you ain't the one feeding me, preacher, I get my food from somewhere else. Well, hallelujah, go to their church. <laughs> hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I don't mean to be ugly, but I'm just trying to say, hallelujah. No, now you're more than welcome to give your tithe here and to give as much. Your offering to the other place could be 15% for all I can. Right. But, but don't come around here with all that monkey shine. Mm -hmm. No, you're either called to be part of this church, right. and if you are, you listen to the word of the Lord, and you pay your tithe to the storehouse of God. Right. Well, you just cut yourself out of a blessing, preacher, because we were going to give you more. Okay. Well, good news. He knows how to. He knows how to fill in the gap. That's right. Hallelujah. I'm just trying to tell you. Bring the bring the offering into the storehouse of God, that there might be meat on my table. Test me in this and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing yes, that you're yes, not even yes. able to yes. But I ain't got enough money now. Oh, don't get me to preach it now. On your ninety percent, my friend. We're gonna be nice. Hallelujah. <laughs> The Lord showed me. I done told y'all. You're probably in your 10%, son. You're probably your 90%. Oh, that's good. You've been living above your means. That's good. Yes. That, you got to catch that. You can't teach that. You got to catch it. Amen? All right. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit's got to reveal that to you. Are you doing the part that he's called you to do? Have you obeyed his voice completely? Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. Have Or have you gripped tightly to something that is your own will and not the will of God? I put a little, cut some Roman numerals here. I pour self out. I ask to be filled with you. I will go where you send me so you can pour you out of me into others. And I remember always, this is good right here. I don't want to lose it right here. 
I remember always that the drink offering is always related to the whole burnt offering. Everything I say, everything I do is to remind others of what you have done for them. You made the way. Miracles are available. Feeling, filling with your spirit. Restored marriages. Our children made whole. Increased souls. It's all in the whole burnt offering. So I give myself to your work, O oh Lord. Make me a drink offering. Imagine this now. Real quick, before I tell you that the Lord let me see something with my spiritual eyes again the other morning when I was praying. Imagine now that you are in Walmart. And you stop and you tell somebody the good news of Jesus and you take an opportunity and you say, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? And all of a sudden, just imagine if you could see it in the spiritual realm. Look, Todd. <laughs> Look at that right there. That's like five wisps of smoke coming up out of Walmart right there. Look, I'm going over the bridge. Look, look, Rob. Look, look, uh, what is it like? Not the life comes back. Look, Daddy. What was that? What's that smoke over there coming off that that other church over there? What? what look, at, look at that over there. Everywhere, you people pouring out their drink offering on the whole burnt offering, and it's rising up yeah. like a sweet. Savor unto the Lord and is bringing glory to God. You are the drink offering, my friend. Yes. The other morning I was in prayer and this message had already been in my heart. But I was able with my spiritual eyes. I know it was the Lord because I, because I wasn't thinking about all of this. And all of a sudden, though, I could see uh, the priest. He had flayed the animal open and he had inspected the insides. They were already washed. Everything was separated, the head and the fat. Everything was arranged on the altar, and then all of a sudden, it went to like an aerial view. Like you could imagine like a, a satellite view looking down upon the arrangement of the sacrifice and the smoke. The, 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 the drink offering was poured on it, and the smoke began to rise in the air. And I could see, I, I'm not going to tell you I saw the Father's face because this is not true, but I could sense that he was smiling, and then immediately the image changed, and Jesus is trembling in the garden. Jesus is trembling in the garden. And he's got blood and sweat on his brow. And he's crying out, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And I can see the Father smiling. And then the image changed, and it was you, and it was me, and it was a drink off. And it was being poured out. And the odor of soothing was filling the air. And the Father was smiling. He wants you to know that he's prepared a way for you to be a drink offering. He wants to fill you up and he wants to use you. And your life can bring pleasure yeah. to your Father. Let's worship him in Jesus' name. If you need prayer.